Joe Morgan might have been white on the outside, but on the inside, he was brown. Raised in the barrios of East LA, Morgan was a Chicano at heart and even became a legendary Mexican mafia godfather. Some might say he was the brain and drive behind the Mexican mafia's rise to power in the criminal underworld. Seth Ferranti here, your guide through the dark corners of the criminal underworld. As an outlaw filmmaker, author, and journalist, I've delved deep into the minds of gangsters, drug lords, and prison gangs. But my journey doesn't stop there. Let me take you on a thrilling ride as we explore the hidden stories and untold truths that lurk behind the prison walls. What's up? I'm Seth Ferrate. Welcome to Seth Ferrate's True Crime. Today we take a hard look into the incredible life of Joe Pegleg Morgan. The white dude, he became a Mexican Mafia leader and left an undeniable mark on the criminal underworld. Morgan's rise to power and infamy within the vicious world of La Eme would change the landscape of gangland forever. There's a scene in the movie American Me where actor William Forsyth, who plays JD, the character based on the legendary Mexican Mafia godfather Joe Peg Leg Morgan, hits the yard at dual vocational institution as a newbie and is immediately confronted by white prisoners. The whites quickly realize that JD isn't the typical peckerwood when he responds to them in Spanish and a group of Mexican-American gangsters roll up glaring at the woods and embrace JD as one of their own. The scene goes even more in depth when one of the Mexican-Americans questions the shot caller Santana about JD being white and rolling with them. Santana kills the issue by letting his homeboy know that JD was down with the click. He was a homeboy with heart, courage, and discipline who would become a top shot caller in the vicious prison gang known as La MA. An ever-present and dangerous entity in California's Department of Corrections. Joe Morgan was a nails-tough Croatian who grew up in a Hispanic neighborhood in East LA. Scott Bernstein, who runs GangsterReport.com, says, Morgan was incarcerated for 40 years for crimes ranging from bank robbery to murder. He escaped jail twice, committed murders like he had a license, developed Mexican cartel connections and ties to the Italian mafia. In the chronicles of gangster lore, he was the equivalent of a John Gotti or Pablo Escobar type figure, an infamous gangster known for cold bloodness as well as intelligence and charm. He became a prison celebrity. Although Slavic culturally, he adopted Mexican ways and spoke Spanish perfectly. Richard Valdemar, a retired Los Angeles Sheriff's Department veteran gang investigator for 33 years says, as a kid, he joined one of the Maravilla gangs in East Los Angeles. He's unusual because he's a white boy who grew up in the projects. If you met him and hung out with him for just a few moments, you'd forget that he was white. Although he was a huero, Morgan understood what it was like to be a part of LA's Vado Loco underworld. We're about to uncover the hidden layers of Joe Morgan's character, from his escape attempts to his reputation as a mentor and visionary within the Mexican Mafia. Morgan's story is one of resilience, viciousness, and unwavering loyalty. Joseph P. Morgan was born April 10, 1929 in East Los Angeles. Raised in the barrios of East LA, Morgan was a Chicano at heart who identified as Mexican American and also happened to be one of the baddest motherfuckers around. A big kid for his age, well over six feet, it wasn't long before he got in trouble over an older woman. Elvira Rojo seduced and bedded the teenager, offering him $1,000 to kill her husband. In the early morning of September 16, 1945, Morgan walked into the husband's room and busted open his skull with a rubber hammer. At just 16 years old, Joe Morgan murdered his 32-year-old girlfriend's husband and buried his body, Chris Casparosa, the author of For Blood and Loyalty, said. Then while awaiting trial in the L.A. County Jail, Morgan keyed in on William Westbrook, another 16-year-old who was being transferred to a country forestry camp. Morgan posed as his cellmate and escaped from jail, making it no shock that he went on to become a leader in what the government has alleged is the most dangerous prison gang ever. The next day, Morgan impersonated Westbrook when guards came to transfer him to the camp. After forging his signature on a booking slip, Morgan got into a car with a probation officer sans handcuffs. At San Fernando Boulevard and Colorado Street in Glendale, Morgan jumped from the car, took off, and escaped. The sheriff's department didn't realize a homicide suspect had escaped until hours later. The young criminal was a fugitive, a wanted man, and he made page two of the LA Times with his ballsy escape. He was a daring outlaw of epic proportions, but Morgan wouldn't be free for very long. 
He got captured a couple weeks later on March 8th. Christian Cipollini, who runs ganglandlegend.com, said, The cops got a tip on his whereabouts, and when they showed up, Morgan took off running. The officer shot the fugitive in the leg, shattering the bone and stopping Morgan in his tracks. Due to complications, his leg was amputated just below the knee. This led to authorities and the media dubbing the young criminal Peg Leg, although prison lore holds that no one ever dared call him that to his face. After getting convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to five years to life, Morgan was sent to Folsom State Prison due to what the judge called criminal sophistication. Despite being the youngest inmate to ever hit the yard, Morgan got mad props at the prison. With his story and Elvira's photo in the papers every day, Morgan became a jailhouse celebrity. To his fellow prisoners, having sex with an attractive woman twice his age was a grand caper indeed. Morgan adjusted well and served nine years at Folsom. In July of 1955, Morgan was paroled, but he wasn't in the world for long. On November 30th, 1955, he robbed a West Covina bank of $17,000 with a machine gun. He was arrested by the FBI at a bar in Long Beach one week later. Barely 26 years old, Morgan was sent back to state prison, a convicted murderer, bank robber, and escape risk. During the four decades he spent locked up in the toughest prisons in California, Morgan earned the respect of all prisoners and staff by conducting himself as a gentleman, but you could never forget that he was a gangster. If someone called him a white boy, he would have killed them. Forget everything you know about America's war on drugs. Where it started, when it started, and most importantly, who was involved. This is the untold history of America's original drug lords. to shine a light on Joe Morgan's audacious jailbreak that made headlines. Picture this, tools concealed in an artificial leg, a jail lock picked, and prisoners crawling through pikes to freedom. This daring escape showcased Morgan's street cred and cleverness, leaving law enforcement and the media in awe. In February 1956, the LA Times headline read, Hammer Slayer held in $17,000 bank holdup. Referenced in the article as the man who went to prison for the hammer slaying of his sweetheart's husband, Morgan was slowly building up his criminal resume. He was known as the kind of man who wasn't afraid to kill another with his bare hands or do what was needed to get the job done. At meals, Morgan sat with the Hispanic prisoners and started to form ties with the young Chicanos that would form the core of the Mexican Mafia. Morgan became a mentor of sorts to a lot of the young M.A., teaching them how to do their time in San Quentin. Joe had a reputation long before because his homeboys in Maravilla were probably the largest segment of incarcerated gang members. Morgan was also known as one of the better handball players on the yard, despite his peg leg. His leadership skills were undeniable and he became a visionary for the budding organization. Morgan became first counselor and then business guru to the new gang. Al Prophet, the director of the American Dope series, says, Morgan studied Aztec history and formed solid relationships with Mike Hatchett Eisen and Ruben Soto. In the netherworld of corruption and violence that existed inside California prisons, at the time, prisoners used to settle their disputes with their fists. But when La Eme came along, they started making and hiding weapons in strategic places on the yard so they could grab them when things jumped off. On February 24, 1961, after being subpoenaed to act as a character witness in a murder trial, Morgan masterminded an even man escape from L.A. County after a jail lock was picked and prisoners crawled through a pipe with the aid of tools such as lock picks and hacksaws that Morgan had hidden in his artificial leg. The jailbreak made the front page of the L.A. Times and was called the jail's largest escape ever. Morgan's criminal notoriety was growing when he was captured and walked back onto the yard in San Quentin in 1961 he was a California prison legend who'd escaped multiple times and served 14 years, mostly at Folsom. He learned the Aztec language and taught others so they could communicate in code. 
Morgan was a master negotiator, an expert on doing time, and had connections with all the racial groups. Before we go any further, let me set the stage and give you some insider knowledge about the formation of this notorious prison gang known as La M A, aka the Mexican Mafia. Imagine this, a youth prison in California that houses the most violent and incorrigible teenage inmates. It was within these walls that the Mexican Mafia was born. When we think of prisons, if we bother to think of them at all, that is, there is a tendency to see them as institutions completely divorced from human society, little worlds of their own. Laya May formed in 1957 at Dual Vocational Institution, or DVI, a youth prison in California that housed the state's most heinous, irredeemable, and violent teenage inmates. Legend has it that it was the brainchild of a then 16-year-old Luis Huero Buff Flores, who brought together the toughest, smartest, most dangerous, and ruthless members of various Mexican street gangs at DVI. The special forces of teenage Mexican California gang members who ruled their youth prison yard. From DVI, however, MA were transferred to maximum security adult prisons like San Quentin, where even more ruthless and murderous Mexican inmates joined their ranks. The guards at San Quentin have their own way of describing the mood of the inmates. They call it the climate on the inside. And this summer, the climate is hot. The Mexican Mafia did not materialize in the streets. It formed within prison walls, probably out of necessity. Like virtually any other prison gang, these guys needed to stick together to survive and thrive. The idea soon morphed into creating not just a gang, but a super gang. Eventually, that evolution created vast outside connections and reach, but of course, that kind of expansion also produced enemies. At 40 years old, Morgan made history as the first white member to join La Eme. His commitment and dedication were unwavering as he embraced his role as a soldier within the organization. Morgan's fearlessness, intelligence, and willingness to resort to violence made him a force to be reckoned with. In 1969, at the age of 40, Morgan was sponsored by his friend Mike Hatchett Eisen and joined La M.A., becoming the first white guy to join the organization. He was given the Aztec name Cocaliso and was immediately accepted into the inner circle, whom he had been working with in an advisory role up until that point. Morgan talked the talk, walked the walk, and embraced his role as a Mexican mafia soldier. La M.A. was founded on the principle that every man is equal and the gang operated on a one man, one vote, majority rules system. Leaving their rivalries in the street, the top gangsters merged into one crew. Joining required a formal sponsorship. A made member had to speak up for the individual being considered for membership and take responsibility for them. La M.A. was recruiting gangsters with serious criminal resumes who weren't afraid to use violence as an intimidation tool. Morgan was fearless, aggressive, intelligent, and had a willingness to kill when and wherever for the organization. In the pen, they say, boys fight and men kill. Laya May has a reputation for killing with reckless abandon. It was on and popping, on sight, as they say. Morgan was all about being the best gangster he could be and pushed his brothers to read books on martial arts and weapons. Another book in Morgan's repertoire included Grey's Anatomy. Laya May wanted to identify the most vulnerable spots to attack their enemies with prison shanks and strike the killing blow. For a long time, there'd been a close association between the Aryan Brotherhood and the Mexican Mafia because they have the same enemy, the Black Guerrilla family. But La Emme's sworn enemy was Nuestra Familia. About the same time that Morgan came on the scene, the BGF and NF formed an alliance. The lines were drawn in the sand. Forget everything you know about America's war on drugs. Where it started, when it started, and most importantly, who was involved. This is the untold history of America's original drug lords. Violence was an inherent part of the game. Boys fight and men kill, as they say. Morgan and his fellow gang members operated by a ruthless code, carrying out murders and using violence as an intimidation tool. 
Get ready to explore the gripping world of gangland politics and the intricate web of alliances and rivalries within the Mexican Mafia. In 1972, there was a bloodbath in the California system. 36 prisoners were killed that year, and gang experts believe the Mexican Mafia was responsible for 30 of the killings. Race riots raged at Folsom and San Quentin, major conflicts between black and brown. It jumped off after La M. May hit a BGF soldier at San Quentin. In Chris Blatchford's The Black Hand, Renee Boxer Enriquez says that Morgan was good for at least a dozen murders on his own and had engineered dozens more. La M. May seized control of the flow of narcotics into San Quentin, and as members were transferred out, they did the same thing at other prisons. Nico Varoybov, the author of Dope World, says, Morgan had La M. May getting protection money from incarcerated Italian mafia members running all the prison hustles, and more importantly, he started laying the foundation for the organization on the outside. Seizing control of several community action groups and programs that provided jobs and income fronts for members of the gang that were paroled back to the world and ready to do the gang's bidding. Richard Valdemar recalls his time getting to know this notorious Mexican mafia leader. He was in custody in the LA County Jail when I worked there around 1972 to 73. He was in my module, the high power module, where all the big people from the AB, BGF, and Mexican mafia and some political guys like Black Panthers were. I had direct contact with him on a regular basis. I also ran the law library, which inmates are allowed to attend. He was very polite. He would greet me in Spanish mindful of cultural things, but a lot of these guys at the top don't have that gangster image that's portrayed nowadays. They had the smooth, know-how-to-do-time kind of attitude, but they were dangerous. Over the years, as Valdemar's career in law enforcement progressed, Morgan's name kept popping up in various investigations, but most of the time he was in custody. It showed the reach that Morgan and La M. May had. The Mexican Mafia has no real hierarchy, but members rise to de facto leadership according to what's needed at that time and who's in power. It was law enforcement that labeled Morgan a godfather, but actually, he was just a loyal member of the Mexican Mafia who took charge for the betterment of the organization with the help of several equally powerful members who backed him. It's de facto control. Morgan was a natural leader, so he took on that leadership role. He knew he was in charge. He didn't have to prove it to anyone. If he rose to the pinnacle of La Ame as a wero no less, he must have been one smart, devious, bad motherfucker, but also a loyal, charismatic one with a code of honor. There was a reason why so many alpha male murderers deferred to him, and even the cops tasked with locking him were impressed. Morgan could get people to calm down. He was a diplomat in a certain sense, but as his power grew, Morgan developed enemies and detractors within the ranks of La Ame. Two OGs, Raimundo Bevito Alvarez who murdered a BGF shot caller and Ernesto Kilroy Royal schemed against the rising soldado. They insisted that no one should be in La Eme who wasn't Latino. They didn't like Morgan, but Morgan had too much clout. Morgan was paroled from Folsom in 1971, and when he hit the streets, there were dozens of MA members on the outside as well. Morgan set about to try and organize the brothers into a criminal enterprise. Morgan wanted to spread the M.A. gospel, and along with Kadena, one of La M.A.'s founders, implemented a strategy of leveraging the organization's power inside prison to control territory on the street. Not only did his connections to narcotics suppliers catapult the Mexican mafia into being instant major players in the dope game, his skills as a gangland politician paid dividends in the form of alliances and business relationships with other criminal factions like the Italian mafia, the Aryan Brotherhood, and outlaw biker gangs. Morgan came to the conclusion that a lot of the gang's members were obsessed with settling old scores when they hit the street instead of making progress for the organization as a whole. He envisioned the gang getting into more profitable endeavors. He wanted the gang to become a successful criminal enterprise. He knew murder had its place, but he wanted to use violence to further La Ame's ends instead of settling scores. But if a brother called, he had to back their play. As early as 1973, newspapers were identifying Morgan as the leader of the Mexican Mafia. He couldn't stay out of prison, though. He was always going back on parole violations. During this part of the 1970s, the Mexican Mafia would become well-known all over California. All the Mexican street gangs paid tribute to La M.A. The organization's name spread fear and law enforcement was getting hip to the gang and who their leaders were in and out of prison. After his arrest in 1978, Morgan would never see the streets again.
Forget everything you know about America's war on drugs. Where it started, when it started, and most importantly, who was involved. This is the untold history of America's original drug lords. During this party of the 1970s, the Mexican Mafia would become well known all over California. All the Mexican street gangs paid tribute to La M. The organization's name spread fear in the streets, and law enforcement was getting hit to the gang and who their leaders were, in and out of prison. Morgan and La M.A. were part of a new generation of drug lords that didn't answer to the Italian Mafia. They made their own connects, getting heroin straight from the source. Before, the main smack track to the States ran through the Italians, who got it from French refineries in the Middle East. But as that route started drying up, it was time to look south of the border. Poppy's been grown in the hills of Sinaloa in Mexico since the 19th century. And the connections that Morgan put together in prison allowed La M.A. and their street affiliates to start moving Mexican black tar heroin in the 70s. Morgan had a lot of heroin connections. He did business with the Italians and the Aryan Brotherhood, but Harry Buckley Gamboa, a childhood friend who was hiding out in Mexico, introduced Morgan to Jesus Araujo, the head of the Araujo drug cartel. Shortly after he became Morgan's main supplier of heroin, he let everyone in Southern California's criminal underworld know that if they were in the dope business, they had to sell Mexican mafia dope. If you refused, you were hit, murdered. Morgan considered the Mafia's financial condition the most important aspect, but other brothers didn't share his opinion. With made members in every major southern city in California, Morgan knew that La and May was sitting on a gold mine. Morgan envisioned the gang being like the Italian Mafia. He wanted the leaders of the Mafia to insulate themselves from committing violence and minimize those risks. He thought of himself as a Carlo Gambino or Lucky Luciano type calling the shots while the soldiers did the dirty work and counting the money all the way to the bank. In the late 70s, prominent mafia killer Ramon Mundo Mendoza became a government informant. Morgan had no idea that one of his trusted confidants was actively working against him and playing ball with law enforcement. Mundo testified that Morgan was responsible for ordering multiple murders both inside the belly of the beast and out on the street. He implicated Morgan in the murder of Robert Mrazek, an associate of La M.A. who was shot to death in 1977. Mrazek's wife Helen had allegedly asked Morgan to kill her husband. After his arrest in May of 1978, Morgan would never see the streets again. In 1992, the Edward James Olmos film, American Me, was released. It was a fictionalized version of the Mexican Mafia La M.A. story and included the character J.D., based on Morgan. The movie raised the stature of the Emmy and put them on the map, just like the Godfather did for the Italian Mafia. Good evening, folks, and a hearty welcome to our drive-in theater. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you, one that will provide several hours of pleasurable relaxation and diversion for you and your family. In 1992, the Edward James Olmos film, American Me, was released. It was a fictionalized version of the Mexican Mafia story and included the character J.D. based on Morgan. The movie raised the stature of La M.A. and put them on the map just like the Godfather did for the Italian Mafia. La M.A. went from being just a prison gang to being recognized as a bona fide criminal organization. The problem the Mexican Mafia had with the movie was that La M.A. hero Rudy Cheyenne Cadena, who was represented by the Santana character, got raped on the inside an event that didn't occur and one that La M.A. couldn't let pass. Richard Valdemar said that when they made that movie, they actually approached Morgan and supposedly got unofficial permission to make that movie as long as he hired Mexican Mafia advisors and almost did in fact do that. But when he did that, he put himself under the rules of the Mexican Mafia. After the film's release, Morgan filed a lawsuit against Almost Universal and several others seeking $500,000 in punitive damages. In the court filing, Morgan argued that a character depicting him in the film committed crimes he didn't do, and that hurt his chances for parole. 
Morgan also argued that they didn't have the right to use his likeness or his story without his permission. The case was eventually dismissed, but three people associated with both the film and the Mexican Mafia were murdered after the film was released. Uh, we're headed into probably the hardest point of the shoot. We now know that in the last week, there have been three deaths in the two block radius in which we're working. The fallout from the movie has caused Hollywood to shy away from any other Mexican Mafia related projects. On November 9th, 1993, Morgan died of cancer at the age of 64 at Corcoran State Prison Hospital. There were two correctional officers in the room with Morgan when the priest came in to read him his last rites. Even as he died, Morgan kept his true character and dismissed the priest, not wanting to have anything to do with him. Morgan was a career prison gangster who went hard and helped solidify the Mexican Mafia as one of the most powerful gangs in the United States. Today, La Ame controls almost all of the Hispanic gangs in Southern California, a vast network of Sereno gangbangers who do the bidding of their vicious prison shot callers. After the three technical advisors from American Me were murdered, the actor who played JD, William Forsyth, called up Richard Valdemar and asked him, hey, am I in trouble? Valdemar told the actor, no, they love you. They think you've played him to perfection, so you're not in trouble. In fact, he says, the scene where he's walking onto court with the leather jacket on, if I didn't know that was the actor, I would have thought that was Joe Morgan. As we reach the end of this edition of Seth Ferranti's True Crime, one thing is clear. Joe Morgan's impact on the Mexican Mafia cannot be denied. It's crazy to think that the scariest dude in the Mexican Mafia was a white dude. If there was one person in the Mexican Mafia that you didn't want to come up against, it was definitely Joe Pegleg Morton. Dude was vicious. Oh, 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 oh,